Why does Fenerbahce keep winning? They're making this so much harder than it has to be. Now I probably need at least a point in this match. We're playing arguably the most talented team in the world, but you know what? We have shocked teams before. He's in there. Hinneman's there! Sander Hinneman! Unbelievable save! Stay with him. Yes, Bube. We're gonna need him to be immense for the rest of this game. Is there an angled ball on? Yes, in the middle! Axel Perez! Is he in? Game it is! That's a goal, baby! It seems so improbable, but now they have the lead. They can start to fathom a win. Like here, we're behind it again. We're behind it again. Sander can run by them too. Sander, yeah! Just mark up, mark up, mark up, mark up. Woo! We did enough. We did enough. We barely did enough. It's simply the biggest win in the history of Florence Stool for AC. Seven years ago, Floridsdorfer was a team that hadn't been in the top flight of Austria in nearly 70 years. And we just beat Manchester City away in a must-win Champions League fixture to get ourselves into the knockout stages. And it wasn't a fluke. We actually had more XG than they did. So this is how you beat teams that you really shouldn't be beating. And we really, 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 really shouldn't have been winning this game. Just look. Look at how absolutely freaking disgusting this Manchester City team is in 2029. They're doing their whole 4-4-2 nonsense with just some of the best players in the world that we were able to hang with the last time we played them. But I mean, they're just dumb. They are. They have the best. They have just the best players in the world at almost every position. When you take a look at our team, we're not bad. This is probably our best player, but we are nowhere even in the same stratosphere when it comes to talent. We're nowhere near what they are capable of at quite literally every, every single position. Let's get the tactics board up. So they start with a 4-4-2, and they've got some incredibly talented players all over that formation, namely Phil Foden coming out of the center of midfield, Chevalier, who, I mean, you just saw his attributes, he's nasty coming off the left side, and they've got the double striker pressure from two absolute world-class strikers. We're using our classic Zealand formation in FM22, the 4-1-3-2, but we've made some adjustments. We've taken one of the two attacking midfielders and switched them to box to box, and we have set a tight mark to Phil Foden. We've also lowered our line of engagement so that we're more compact and able to follow runs and react to things quicker once they break the initial pressure. When you are the better team, or maybe even the even team, you are trying to create opportunities while going forward. But in these situations where you are the worst team, especially on the road, your goal is to try and counter out those threats and leave yourself with one or two options to go and actually score a goal. That could be your tremendous set pieces. Or that could be, in our case, Xander Henneman, the wonderful Xander Henneman, who is incredibly fast and has the ability to find space that most people just can't find. And we planned on having that space to exploit. My entire offense in this game is based off of two forward players that are going to keep the pressure on their team. Everybody else on my team is going to be trying to get in the way and facilitate getting those two players open, which is Henneman, who you've already met, and Given Marquez, who is also trying to do the same thing. He's just not as fast. And it might not be exactly obvious where these threats are coming from over the course of the game. After giving up a really obvious chance to Chevalier, I make the decision that like Phil Foden, he probably needs a tight mark as well. Honestly, I'm not really worried by that shot. That wasn't that, uh, that wasn't super duper threatening. I am a little worried by how fluid this has been down this side. So Paz Bichel's actually a stupid good athlete. Let's have him stay with Charpentier. Now there are particular roles that I like to type mark that you see here. Midfielders that make those late runs into the box and inverted wingers or inside forwards, whether they're farther up or back in the midfield, they give me serious problems once they get inside the fullback and your center backs are already occupied, especially against two striker formations. Tight mark can be very effective at trying to take them out of the game, and Chevalier never got a chance that clear for the rest of the contest. An important side note, though, you have to have people that are capable of executing that game plan. For example, my right back is Roman Devletchen. Now, while he is not as good as Chevalier, he is also not an offensive wingback. He is somebody that is very good at defense, is physically sound. He's not going to keep up with Chevalier in a dead sprint, but he can stay close enough to him. And he is a defensive dynamo. And so if I put a tight mark on Chevalier, it's going to be mainly my right back, Roman Devletchen, that's having to do it. And I trust that he is going to be able to get close enough 
that it's going to improve my chances to type mark him and try and prevent that run from developing again. And I know you're going, wait, 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 wait. I've seen you in a video before say type marking is a disaster. It drags your players out of position and you're right. I have said that and it's still entirely possible, but in the most up-to-date engine on FM22, type marking is actually a tremendously effective way to stop those late runs that are so good in FM22. It's why I was unable to repeat as streamer showdown champion because word got out that you could just type mark the late midfield runs that I try and create in my 4132, and I have a really hard time creating offense. So let's check our checklist that I'm just inventing for right now. Have we set ourselves up to counter their threats? Some type marking, and we've got enough bodies in position to deal with the 442. So Yes. Have we left ourselves with one or two options to actually go score goals? Which, you know, if we only have one striker and we have nobody else making a secondary run, they can be alone, but we have two strikers. So we do have the ability to go two on two with their center backs. If their wing backs get up, that's too long to put on the list. But can we offer a threat the other direction? Yes. And do we have players that are in a spot that they can actually execute, i.e., somebody that can get near enough to Chevalier that they might be able to slow them down? Yes, well, then we're off to a hot start at how we actually managed to pull this off, but this is a pretty dangerous list. It's got a lot of important information on it, so we should probably protect it with NordVPN. You've probably heard about NordVPN before. They're a longtime sponsor of this channel, but if you are using the internet without a VPN, you are exposing yourself unnecessarily to people being able to figure out where you are, or worse, perhaps, finding your information. And what a VPN does is it protects your internet traffic by running it through somewhere else in the world so that it is much harder to track. If you use the link down in the description, you will actually get a two year plan with one month completely free. And it's also a 30 day money back guarantee. So even though it's incredibly easy to use, I know it sounds complicated, but look at the UI. You literally just click and say, I want to go here and you're there. If you don't like just zipping all over the place, you can get your money back for free for the first 30 days with the link in the description. So check out NordVPN, keep yourself safe on the internet, especially if you're on public Wi-Fi all the time. Maybe you're in school, they've got the school Wi-Fi. Keep yourself safe. Use NordVPN. That's where I'm stashing my list of things to how you beat teams that are better than you. There's actually another part of the opposition instructions that you can use. I didn't use it in this Manchester City match, but I did use it earlier in my game against Inter. Now, Inter's got a really particular problem. They have Lotaro Martinez, and he is a problem. And they had a guy on the opposite end of the field who was also a problem. We looked at that person on the opposite end of the field that had played Lotaro Martinez in once already and said, then what if we just close them down? Oh no. We did that, and for the next 75 minutes of the match, Lotaro was not played in again. We shut down where the actual pressure was being created from. That was the ball they were looking for, and closing down can really work for that. If you can find the people that are providing the service to the play that breaks your team, shut them down. At the very least, force them to dribble before they can make that pass. They're better than you. They might be able to do that anyways, but at least you're not just taking it lying down. We'll look at our first goal, and this actually came from an entire tactical side that had nothing to do with the quality of the teams. We get the ball wide to Joshua Aliu. And the moment we get comfortable possession with a ball in space, we actually have a pretty distinct advantage over Manchester City because we have four midfielders and they have two. As Aliu attacks one of those central midfielders, we see Axel Perez, who is on get further forward, start to make a run through the middle. The midfielders, who are both offensive-minded Phil Foden-type midfielders, don't track the run. They step up on Aliu. He slips the pass, and because we have the two strikers, the center backs don't know what to do, and all of a sudden, we have our first goal. The second goal is actually much more similar to what we were talking about, tactically trying to set up. This is what we were expecting. A long ball forward, one of my tall center backs, Ulrich Torbjörnsson, heads the ball down. It's picked up by Perez, who's one of those playmakers. A first-time ball up to one of the forwards, and now we're in a situation where it is two on two. Pretty good job by Max Aarons to recover because he's actually a human lightning bolt here, but we did end up with a two on two against their center backs. My two advanced forwards, pressure on the whole time. They're able to put a pass together and in the nick of time, find the back of the net. And over the course of the game, we are able to keep them away from what I'll call obvious goal scoring opportunities. You'll hear me talk about this a lot on stream. There is no way for me to dominate the game against Manchester City because they are so good. What we can do is make them score goals of eminent quality and not because we're idiots. Unfortunately, that's actually exactly what happened. Oh, yeah. Get in the way, Adrian, 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 run. 
We have a tight mark on Foden. How did this happen? We have a tight mark on Foden. How did this happen? You fools. Hmm. They switched sides. Okay. They've bowed now. We need to pick those guys up. They changed their midfield, and I didn't notice until after the goal was scored. They switched both of their midfielders to attacking runs, where previously it was just Phil Foden making an attacking run. What that ends up causing is us not being able to properly mark the players that are making those runs. We have one defensive midfielder. He is right there. His name is Adrian Rodriguez. He picks up the first attacking run from Choi Seong Min, who is a very good region in this save. After he picks up that run, Torbjornsson follows Bustos, the striker, backward. And Axel Perez, who is on get further forward as we've covered, is now stuck following the other midfielder, and that's Phil Foden. He's not going to follow him back far back. They're too good. They see the hole, and we actually give up the most obvious chance of the entire game, a free ball in to the goal itself. The other change was that Raheem Sterling, who'd come in and I immediately marked because he was doing the same thing as Chevalier, was not necessarily as involved as much as I thought. So because I know I can't just type mark everybody, I take it off of Sterling and put it on Choi. So so now I'm still only tight marking two players, but I'm tight marking the two dangerous players that actually created that goal. I also go into my tactic and I set up more solid defensive positions for my outside midfielders. On the left, I go with a Carlero. On the right, I go with a deep lying playmaker because that fits the skill sets of those two players, but it's also much more positionally sound than box to box where you basically go wherever your heart desires, which is good when you're defending a lot of ground, but bad when you need to make sure you can track a deeper run and be in the right spot to do it. Those two decisions work in concert to help us kill off the game, which is you know, the final thing on the checklist. Now you have a lead, got in the game. I have a cut and dry formula for doing this. I put my passing directness and my tempo on lower and my time wasting up to the middle. I do this if I'm feeling really nervous, maybe even with 15 minutes left to go in the game, because once you do this, you are taking away some of your punching power. Other ways to help kill the game off, play for set pieces, and I also turn off my counter press and my distribute quickly, and I turn that into slow down the pace. Very rarely will I take off counter. You still want to have some sort of threat. Once I get into stoppage time, you'll see me actually take that all the way down. Time wasting all the way up, tempo all the way down, everything all the way down. And then in very rare cases, I'll even go to hold shape, which is the opposite of, of counter. If they're pressing the bejesus out of you, turn on long distribution and cancel play out of defense if you have it so that you do not turn the ball over in a late situation and cause yourself to smash one or multiple keyboards. There are all sorts of conspiracy theories that float around this sort of stuff, but at the end of the day, it makes you better defensively late into the game. And every manager in the history of ever has debated the right time to make those sorts of decisions. So I kind of have to leave that to you, feeling out the game, feeling out your team, and whether you think it's going to help or whether you think you're going to need to keep the pressure on. There is never an exact right answer, but it does help with a minute to go to actually be wasting time to get to the end of the game. All right, so there is a point. And then you win the game and you celebrate wildly. Yes! There are a few more important things how we pulled this off that weren't necessarily in the tactical equation at the beginning. We had a strong leader. A player that had been at the club for five years is at the team leader level of the hierarchy and is wearing the captain's armband on that field on that day. That helps your team be more resilient, especially on the road. Our team was happy, and so they were able to handle the team talks. We had kept morale up, and we only had one issue in the locker room, a player that I hadn't made any promises to that wanted to move to a bigger club, but that I wasn't in an active argument with. The most important piece to all of this is that throughout the game, my tactic changed multiple times. You notice this. We, we started the match with a tactic that I don't normally play, but it's all within the same system. Have a lot of different plans for your tactic tactical flexibility inside your system. So your system is players that do certain things, your strikers that are advanced forwards, your midfielders that pass, your midfielders that tackle, your midfielders that eat space, your fullbacks do this, your center backs do that. That is your system. And they're always in these general areas. And they are always in these general areas. I know they're all in Ibiza right now, but focus. We have the ability to shift this tactic to chase a goal, while not necessarily changing the way these people play or the way the people around them play. I can do this on both of these guys, and they can do that comfortably because they're able to play defense. I can really get incredibly defensive up here if I want to and do something like this, and all of a sudden I am remarkably 
remarkably defensively responsible. You saw me switch to something that looks like this towards the end of the game. I was limited by personnel a little bit, but this is a great way to cancel out anybody trying to put pressure defending inside out. And very late in games that I feel like I'm being overrun on the wing, I will actually move one of my strikers over to winger so that they can run back and help with defensive cover and make a secondary run to keep my counter alive just a little bit. None of this has changed the core job of the players I have on the field, and they're changes that I can make without having to make any subs because of that. But they completely change whether I'm being more responsible in this area or more fluid and aggressive in that area. While you see they adjust your tactical familiarity in the top, they don't adjust your tactical familiarity entirely. We're completely familiar with everything we're doing, except for some players in the position role they're being asked to play in. And so the overall familiarity with the strategy is good. What I typically recommend is that you train three tactics, but those three tactics are variations of your same system. So that as you train those tactics, you are improving familiarity with those different positions and roles. This will allow you to adapt your incredibly aggressive gegenpress into something that isn't gegenpressing, but is able to receive encounter without being so defensive that you're screwed. And that's it. No, 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 no. Okay, there's one more thing. And then you pray to the FM gods. Because even after you've done all this, you're still probably going to lose. You've just made your chances of winning better. You would like to watch more about this tactic that I use? Here's a whole video explaining how it works and why it works. Thank you for joining us today.